how do you get from a private key to a Bitcoin address? Hey and welcome to today's video. My name is Julian. This is part one of a three-part series with an extra bonus episode in explaining Bitcoin from a cryptographic perspective. If you're watching my entire cryptographic crash course, then this is episode 12. And I'm telling you already, we're going to build on top of a lot of the basics that we learned in those past 11 episodes. I told you that those past 11 episodes were basically the basic on cryptography. And now we're digging deeper into cryptocurrencies. And we're starting with the mother of all cryptocurrencies, namely Bitcoin. And today we're also going to do something a bit different, which is we don't use a writing pad. I'm actually going to go onto my computer, sharing my screen, discussing the seven steps in getting from private key all the way to a Bitcoin address. And then I'm going to show you in Python how this could work from a programming perspective. And for those of you that are Python experts, looking forward to get some feedback because I'm definitely not a Python expert. And uh, yeah, very interesting to see and get some input on this. And maybe for those of you that don't understand much programming, don't worry, it's very, very basic. It's really more on the cryptographic perspectives. So let's dive right in. Let's do a screen share and let's have a look how this works to get from Bitcoin to an actual address. So very, very key perspectives. Well, the entire thing, what you will see is that actually cryptocurrencies was created by cryptographers and not so much by software engineers. More of the Ethereum part came from software engineers. Um, mostly the cryptocurrency is very, very cryptography heavy. And I think that's very, very interesting. We have those three parts. Um, if for those of you that want to watch the entire background, and this is important, you should understand what hash functions are, how elliptic curve cryptography works, because we're not going to go into this. I'm, con I'm assuming you understand how these things work. I'm going to link it up also below the video, how this then works. Part one of this three part series is going to be this one private key to Bitcoin address. We're going to have a bonus episode where we talk about hierarchical deterministic wallets. That's going to be the next video, actually, where we're going to have um, a small bonus episode. Then in the real second part, we talk about how to create transactions. And in the last one, we talk about mining. So let's get started. Very, very relevant, very interesting. One quick reminder, a Bitcoin wallet does not store coins. It stores private keys. Very, very important. So this means we can distinguish between two major different wallet types. The one are the non-deterministic wallets, and then we have the deterministic wallets. And we're going to be discussing the deterministic wallets in the next episode. We're going to discuss the non-deterministic wallets right now. And we discuss the seven steps. Step number one, very basic. We use a random number generator to create our private key. The private key has 256 bits, which is 32 bytes. If we use uh, hex in hexadecimals, then this is 64 uh, characters because in hexadecimals we have per character 16 different options. Or, and we're going to look this up also in Python then, it's approximately an 80 digit, 80 digit decimal integer. Actually, it's 78 digits, but let's just round this. Um, now, what's very, very important on the random number generator to create your private key in most programming languages, if you just use the random function, then this is actually not truly random and you could brute force it. So you need to use a cryptographic module. Um, if this is written in Python and this is very basic Python, so I, you're going to understand this quite easily. If we import um, the Bitcoin library, basically, then we have this function called random key. And in this case, we just generate a variable, which is, or we have a variable key underscore private, and it just gets created out of a random key. And so I run this and then I print it out and I get this private key. This is in hexadecimal. So what I do here is I make it an integer and this is then in decimal form, the integer um, for the private key. If I measure the length of this, then I see 78 uh, characters, so, or 78 digits. So this is basically just doing this and I, I'm gonna show you um, that I could rerun this over and over again. So let's just briefly go over. Let's uh, restart this and clear all the outputs. So here we have those lines. Let me run those first line. Let me generate a private key. Uh, let me rerun this and then you will see the private key constantly changes. So it's tr truly random 
directly imported from the Bitcoin library. The next one makes it a, hexade a decimal. So this is now the decimal. Now, if I rerun this line, it should stay the same, obviously. And uh, measuring the length, 78 characters. Uh, very straightforward. So let's go back. Now, we need to do one important thing in this entire process, which is um, that we need to be sure that the private key is actually part of the curve order. And the, and the reason this is relevant is because uh, the modular is the largest prime or the largest 256-bit prime. And here, this is written out. Um, and if you actually calculate this, it is 2 to the power of 256 minus 2 to the power of 32 minus 2 to the power of 9 minus 2 to the power of 8 minus 2 to the power of 7 minus 2 to the power of 6 minus 2 to the power of 4 minus 1. So it is not exactly 2 to the power of 256, but it's really, really, really close. And we can actually go and type this out if we want to. So we can go there and we can check is our private key smaller than 2 to the power of 256. So let's print this out and it says true. So this is really important. Um, if you just want to see um, how, much, uh, how much this prime number actually is, this is the modular. Um, it's a really, really large number. It's the largest 256 bit number. And this is how much smaller it is than 2 to the power of 256. So you can see it's actually not completely 2 to the power of 56, but it's this much smaller. So it's really, really tiny compared to the full number. Um, this is actually bonus knowledge for those of you because most people don't actually notice that it's not truly 2 to the power of 256. But actually, I've, you, you can try it um, and you, you can calculate the odds. The odds that you generate one of those numbers that is actually outside is so tiny that it's pretty much irrelevant. But you still have to check it um, in order to be sure um, yeah, that it's a proper number and that it's actually on the curve. Um, so let's keep going. Um, you could actually generate your private key three different ways. Um, you could use a coin, pencil, and paper. Um, heads or tails is zero or one, so this would work for a binary number. Now you could do it with a computer program. This is what I've been doing here in Python. Or, and this is obviously what happens in 99.99% of the time, you do it in a wallet. And this is nothing else than a wallet does. A wallet generates the private key, and this is what the wallet then stores, right? And this is very straightforward. So now how do we get from this private key to the public key. Well, it's very straightforward. We have our elliptic curve, um, and we use this very specific elliptic curve in Bitcoin. And we have this generator point, um, G. And we have a compressed and uncompressed form. Um, the difference is very, is very, very basic. In uncompressed, which we see here, we have the X and Y coordinate. So we actually have double the size. So it's 64 bytes. Uh, remember, the private key is 34, uh, 32 bytes. In the compressed form, we only have the x-coordinate because we can simply calculate the y-coordinate by filling it in so we only need half the space. So this is very very basic and we use the same thing in the public key as well. So if we want to we can then go and say okay what does this um, public key actually look like? So let's run this and this is what this x-coordinate actually looks like. Remember the x-coordinate is where we have the maximum order in this private uh, in this uh, elliptic curve and then going from this public key, uh, from this generator point, with the private key, which is basically the ex how often we multiply or we add this uh, generator point to each other, we generate the entire curve in a very unpredictable um, way. This is uh, very, very important to understand how this then works. So if we go from here, and this is now basically what we're doing, we have the generator point, um, we multiply it times the, pub the private key, we get the public key, and now we get the x and the y coordinate, and again, we have the key public in 64 bytes, which is the same way as the generator point, um, that it's basically uncompressed. And we're going to look how we're going to get the compressed form. So the examples that you see here are obviously different than here because we generate constantly new private keys. So when I did this, when I made the screenshots, um, then this was obviously a different private key. Um, and hopefully I never generate the same private key because it's uh, directly taken from the Bitcoin library. So here we have the uncompressed public key in hexadecimal, um, and then we have it in decimal. So very simple. So I just generate the key uh, public is private to public key. There's actually a function in uh, Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, then I just have it either uncompressed or I can just take it uh, from the hexadecimal and put it into the decimal form. Fantastic. So this was 
Step two. Step three is to compress it. Compressing it is very, very simple. Um, we don't need the y coordinate, we just need x. So, and what we actually do is we look if x is, um, it, it just depends what happens to the x coordinate. We either add a, a 0, 2 if y is even, or we add uh, 0, 3 at the beginning if the if y is odd and that's just basically uh, telling us if we're taking one way or the other way of the coordinate. That's just very, very straightforward um, to do this. Um, while let's do this automatically for you, uh, for us, uh, we just have this basically in there. And uh, yeah, here is just basically the calculation for those that uh, care. Um, again, for those that really that of you are really good in Python, give me some feedback on it. I'm sure I have some mistakes in my Python code, um, but uh, yeah, that's really not about this. For me, the Python is more the experimental side for myself. The crypto side is something that I understand really, really deeply and, uh, and quite well. So, okay, great. So now we have compressed the public key and now we need to encrypt it. And to encrypt it, we run the public key through or the, the compressed pri uh, public key, uh, private, uh, sorry, the compressed public key through two hashing algorithms. First, we do SHA-256 and then RIPE-MD-160. Obviously, the order is really relevant. So we do first SHA-256, then we do RIPE-MD-160. For those of you that understand this already, we actually could, in theory, could have some collisions here because we, we um, have a smaller key space now. We go from 256 to 160, um, but in practically, this is very, very unlikely. Um, here, I run this through. So I import this hash library and then um, compressing it and then let's do it again. And uh, one, another thing that you will see here is I'm adding two zeros. The reason I'm adding two zeros here is actually the next step and that's the network type. So if I'm in the mainnet, then I add two zeros. For the testnet, I add uh, 6f as a byte. So that's just why I add those two zeros here. And now basically we have um, the public key encrypted. And so the last thing is we do a checksum. The checksum is similar how it works in a credit card. The checksum is something that is done in Bitcoin for some, to me, completely understandable reason. We don't have this in Ethereum. It's just if you have a typo somewhere in there, it could be seen afterwards because you can see that some things don't work out, similar like in a credit card. And the way it works is quite straightforward. We apply uh, SHA-256 twice, and then we take the first four bytes and we add them at the end. So basically you can see this here, if we run this, then you can see here, this is the result. So here I run it first time, I run it the second time, I print it out, then this is here the hash, and now I add those here at the end. Great, and now the last thing that we do in order to get our final Bitcoin address and to get those 34 letters and numbers that we are used to is to encode it with base 58. And uh, this is a very simple encoding scheme that represents large integers as an alphanumeric text. And it allows it very easy to kind of check those things and make sure they actually work. Um, there's actually a function in uh, the Bitcoin library um, called bup to add, and uh, that gives me the entire um, public address then for Bitcoin. So here, this would be the actual Bitcoin address to this private key. And I could run this entire thing again. I would need to run the entire cells here. Um, I need to run this one as well. Let me run this one. And I can skip those. No, I need to run those as well, otherwise it's gonna not work. And so now I get a new address. Whoop! And this is a new address. And so many, many people are always confused about this. How can I do this offline? I mean, I'm online right now, but how could I do this offline? It's just because it's all cryptography. And when we are talking about uh, making transactions, then you actually understand we're signing that this is nothing else than cryptography, and you understand all these. A really basic concept from un, from watching the other videos. Um, a few notes, right? Uh, thinking about all this, um, especially with these non-deterministic wallets. Now, your wallet probably doesn't work this way anymore. It works hierarchical. We're going to discuss how this works. How it works deterministic. Um, you will see how this works. Um, first, you cannot lose coins. You can only lose private keys. So you need to back private keys up. Very very important. Um, also, obviously, in the very early days with Satoshi, the odds that this group still has all the private keys. I think it's very, very unlikely because if you have all these different addresses, you have all these different private keys because they're not 
uh, tied to each other. Um, and because it's a non-hierarchical wallet, you need to save um, every individual uh, key. Actually, it's a non-deterministic wallet. So you need to save every individual one. Um, and <laughs> that's uh, quite a lot. How you can improve this is something we're going to be discussing in the next episode. And basically what we're doing here is instead of generating um, constantly one, uh, one private key and then getting into a new address, we could actually generate private keys from each other and then generate addresses from there. So all we need to have is the very first kind of seed and generate private keys through functions from there. And uh, this is um, yeah, then a quite elegant um, solution. In order to finish this off, Let's try something, and I wrote a very small piece of code here that does something very interesting. And you might have seen this where you have addresses that where the address has some nice words in there. For example, I could have an address that has Julian in there. And so in, the way you do this is you would have to try out a lot, a lot of private keys in order to get a certain address. Or what you can also do is instead of generating a private key. So here we have a private key of the function random key. This is the uh, random key function in Bitcoin. Um, we could also go and say, let's run a SHA-256 out of something and uh, see what happens to the private key here. So let's run this and it says, what word should be your private key? Leave it empty if you want the random one. So I could go and say, Julian. So now I'm getting a private key in hexadecimal and in decimal. And I'm getting obviously a public key. Here, bonus question for you. Is this public key compressed or uncompressed? Let me know in the comments below. Uh, what do you think about this? And here is the Bitcoin address about it. And so here's the trick. So this Bitcoin address, so let's just remember the last four digits here, BU6D. So let's run this again, and it should be the exact same one. And it's the same one, right? Now, obviously, let's say I leave it empty. Then this thing should be completely random, and there should be it should be impossible um, to generate the same private key ever again. Um, this part is going to be something we're going to be discussing in the next episode about how to sign um, and about how to verify. Fantastic. I hope this explains to you how you generate a private key. This should have been clear. How you get from there to a public key, uncompressed, compressed, encrypted, and then how you do a checksum and how you go all the way to the actual Bitcoin address. Let me know what you think. If you like this stuff, give me a thumbs up. I hope it's clear. And if you're confused, then you're missing some of the early episodes and you should watch those. With this, I hope I see you at the next episode where I talk about, um, in this case, the deterministic wallets and then about transactions and uh, subscribe if you want to get notified. See you at the next video. Yours truly, Julian.